welcome back to my channel so far we were discussing about the angle complex biomechanics and we reached up to the subtalar joint here in this video we are going to discuss a pretty new concept that is the subtalar neutral what is subtalar neutral what are the possible range of motion that is possible in the subtalar joint why subtalar joint or subtalar neutral is important clinically what do you mean by calcaneo valgus what do you mean by calcaneo varus so we will be discussing each and every one of this detail in this video Yes, as I told you, we had already discussed about the subtalar joint. And now we are trying to estimate or find out what is the possible range of motion in the subtalar joint. And when we are discussing about the range of motion, this term known as a subtalar neutral comes into the picture. Let us see what it is and why is it relevant. Okay, for example, if you want to estimate the range of motion of shoulder, or elbow what should you do you just have to take the measuring device that is the goniometer and just measure the range of motion possible that's so easy but such an easy method is not possible in the case of subtalar joint why that is because can anybody tell me the answer what is the reason for that can you just think on what is the reason why we cannot have a straight head discussion or straight head um, measurement of the subtala range of motion why that is because the subtala joint is a composite joint that is it is multiplanar in orientation that is the subtalar joint we studied in uh, previous videos that is a multiplanar or triplanar orientation that means uh, it's not just in one single plane and it is not just one single motion that is happening but it's a combination of movement if anybody is watching this video for the first time kindly have a glance at the previous videos right and then come back to this otherwise it, you might feel it tough to understand along with that there is another factor that is the inclination of subtalar joint inclination of subtalar joint axis joint axis right so we see that this multiplanar nature actually multiplanar is because it is having two type of a uh, three type of articular surface anterior middle and posterior anterior and middle behave same posterior behaves in the opposite manner so this provides a multiplanar nature to this joint so it is a multiplanar in nature along with that there is an inclination of the subtalar joint axis do anyone uh, can anyone remind re remember the inclination of subtalar joint axis the subtalar joint is of course inclined about 42 degree from the transverse plane right we studied it in previous session at the same time subtalar joint is inclined about a 16 degree from the sagittal plane right the sagittal and for the transverse plane so this is actually a not exactly in sagittal on transverse plane and what happens here is when there is an increase in subtalar joint axis okay for example if this 42 becomes a 44 degree or 50 degree or it decreases what actually happens when it becomes 44 what is happening it is becoming more close to the longitudinal axis right when it is becoming 42 degree it is more coming to the transverse plane so this sort of changes in the inclination even a slight change in the inclination can make the movements that are possible in the subtalar joint much more complicated we know that the predominant movement in subtalar joint is your pronation and supination that is the predominant movement but this movement is actually happening as three separate movements you know that which are that 
that is uh, inversion bar inversion plant deflection bar dot deflection and abduction bar abduction so these are the combination of movement right these are the combination of movement for example plant deflection dot deflection lies in the sagittal plane adduction adduct abduction in the transverse plane and inversion inversion in the frontal plane so we, if this axis is getting more into the frontal plane this component can increase if it is getting more into the transverse plane this component can increase at the same time uh, if this axis is getting uh, more away from the sagittal plane the sagittal plane angle increases away from the sagittal plane so this can produce changes in the normal range of motion and this is quite known to because uh, every human being or either there is a great deal of individual difference between subtalar joint orientation and angle joint structure so what happens is that all these factors together makes estimation of subtalar joint range of motion a complicated and a herculean task i call it herculean because it's all tough to do right so let us summarize that is because of the multiplanar nature of the subtalar joint and the inclination in the inclination if you are writing this for the examination just mention uh, it is oriented 42 degree and 16 degree from the sagittal plane and if this orientation is greatly increased component that are um, components of the subtalar joint motion that is inversion inversion abduction adduction plantar flexion torsi flexion increases as uh, concerned to the corresponding or individual joint axes and plane right so this is a difficulty in estimating the subtalar joint range of motion but anyhow we have to estimate so what can we estimate from this okay so we know that there are three components of subtalar motion i told you now inversion eversion plantar flexion dorsiflexion and uh, abduction and adduction if we look into detail of this three component only one single component in this motion remains the same whether it is in weight bearing or non weight bearing can you tell me which is that component can you tell me the component which remains the same in weight bearing and non weight bearing in this that is the calcaneal inversion and eversion we studied that the talar abduction and adduction plant inflation dorsiflexion becomes exactly opposite between non weight bearing and weight bearing so we have or it is easy for us to estimate inversion and eversion in the subtalar joint and of course this range of inversion and eversion is mostly considered as a normal range of motion of a subtalar joint right how can we estimate it how can we estimate it for example, if we imagine this as a posterior aspect of the foot, right? Posterior aspect of foot, right? And this structure here is your calcaneum, calcaneum, and you have here the bones and everything over here. And this is the posterior view. Um, let me rub that bones because it's uh, uh, getting complicated for you, okay? If you remove that in this posterior view, you can see that uh, here is the calcaneum here is the posterior midline of your foot of course you can estimate that Achilles tendon here you will have the Achilles tendon so this there will be a posterior midline for the foot there is just nothing a midline a line passing through the center of the posterior aspect of the foot for example if this is the foot if you draw a straight line through the longitudinal one that becomes the posterior midline of the foot okay no need to get uh, complicated over that and at this rich stage and a line joining the posterior of the calcaneum okay so what is that there is a line which joins posterior posterior midline of the foot midline of foot or leg whatever it is and posterior aspect of um, posterior aspect of a calcaneum calcaneum now if you look into this line we see that this makes a zero degree angle over there it makes a zero degree angle of that that is there is no degree of uh, inclination or 180 degree whatever it is okay that means these two lines will be straight these two lines will be straight and parallel to each other so, sorry straight to each other so this position of the subtalar joint is what we call the subtalar neutral. So the subtalar neutral is a position at which or in which 
the line joining the posterior midline of the foot or midline of the foot in the posterior aspect you can study that okay line joining the posterior midline of the foot and the line joining the posterior aspect of the calcaneum because we are discussing about the posterior aspect because we told that inversion and diversion is easy to measure posteriorly remember that right because we estimated inversion and diversion in the prone line position not in the supine line position so if there is a line joining these two segments that is a posterior midline of the foot and posterior aspect of calcaneum we get that to be a straight line that means there is a zero degree inclination and that is known as subtalar neutral so subtalar neutral is a position in which the posterior midline of the foot and posterior aspect of the calcaneum line joining okay you should write like this line joining posterior midline of the foot and line joining posterior aspect of calcaneum makes a zero degree angle or lies straight line to each other that position is known as subtalar neutral it can be also known as uh, ideal position. Why ideal position? Uh, do you remember if you have studied the chapter known as posture? We have an ideal sitting posture. We have an ideal standing posture. Maybe ideal standing posture will be this. Ideal sitting posture will be sitting straight. But do we adopt that? We don't because it's not that efficient to the body similarly there is something for you to remember here this is known as ideal position why you will learn later we will look why is it known as ideal position remember that this is an ideal position okay now let us estimate more let us estimate more like um, let's take this one normally there is a subtalar inversion or subtalar inversion whichever is that subtalar inversion and inversion for example if this is the median end of the foot this will be the inversion and this will be the inversion okay and there is normally for every individual like you and me can have an inversion about 5 to 10 degree whereas an inversion about 20 to 30 degree so this is actually normal Normally, we can have inversion about 5 to 10 degree and inversion about 20 to 30 degree. So, totally it makes the subtalar joint range of motion about 20 plus 5, 25, 30 plus 10, 40 degree. So, subtalar joint has a range of motion between 25 to 40 degree added together. Or individually, there is an inversion of 5 to 10 degree and 20 to 30 degree of Eversion. You see that uh, eversion is double the times or triple ex exactly of the in inversion. So eversion is a double, uh, sorry, eversion is double or three times greater than that of the inversion component, right? So now we have a clinical consideration over here. For example, now I am drawing this line alone. So this is the posterior midline of the foot and uh, this is the line joining the calcaneum so this is almost a straight line over here right and now there is a situation in which this posterior midline of the foot and line joining this line okay do not come to be in a straight line and it moves away so this is the medial aspect of the foot this is the lateral aspect of the foot this is the medial aspect of the foot and this is the lateral aspect of the foot right so what happens here actually this medial angle is increasing this medial angle is increasing that means your calcaneum is moved away and slightly laterally oriented this we call it as a calcaneo valgus calcaneo valgus we call it as calcaneo valgus this one is the condition in which this is known as the calcaneo valgus. Whereas at the same time, if um, this line is here and this is actually becoming like this, that means the medial angle decreases. That is known as calcaneo varus. So we have two situations over. I will explain that once more. We have two situations over here. One is the calcaneo valgus and varus. Remember, this is a posterior aspect of the foot. We have line joining the foot, three lines joining the foot. Okay. Now we have a neutral position in which both these lines remain same. Okay. This is the medial aspect, 
this is the lateral aspect okay now in a situation in which the calcaneum is slightly laterally oriented the medial angle increases this is known as calcaneo valgus calcaneo valgus whereas there is a condition in which the medial angle slightly decreases that condition is known as calcaneo varus varus so this is varus deformity and this is valgus deformity and of course you can imagine when does valgus increase valgus increase in the lateral movement that is in pronation whereas varus increases in supination so this is usually seen associated with the uh, uh, pronation increased pronation and this is seen in associated with the increased supination increased supination of the foot that is normally that is normally we have um, this is the normal line and this is known as subtalar neutral but every individual can have every individual can have how many degrees of inversion if this is the medial aspect how many degrees of inversion 5 to 10 degree whereas he can have a greater degree of inversion so this is a normal situation but if at all in individuals if this axis or this lines are away from each other we have the deformity known as calcaneo valgus that means we can do this but if it is remaining fixed in this one or individuals are showing a greater degree of medial angulation more than the normal that is known as calcaneo valgus if it is less than the normal medial angulation this is the medial angulation this is the medial side so we call it the medial angulation uh, if it is decreasing then that condition is known as calcaneo valgus so we saw what is subtalar neutral what is the condition known as calcaneo valgus what is the condition known as calcaneo valgus valgus can produce increased pronation and valgus can produce increased supination deformity in the foot all right so we estimated subtalar joint neutral what is subtalar joint neutral and why is it a significant and what is a normal range of motion so we tell this inversion and inversion and combined movement of 5 plus 10 that is 5 plus 10 that is 15 and 20 plus 10 10 that is 20 plus 10 that is a uh, sorry 5 plus 20 that is 25 and 20 plus that is 5 plus 10 this is the calculation 5 plus 10 and um, 20 plus uh, 15 uh, 20 plus uh, 13 so this becomes uh, a normal of 25 degree and this becomes a uh, 40 degree so we can tell that subtalar joint is having a range of motion about uh, 25 to 40 degree of inversion and uh, inversion right am i clear with you yes sir. now let us examine further into the significance of subtalar joint neutral yes as i told you now let us expand our concept into the subtalar joint neutral why is it significant or is it an exact measurement i told you something i told you i gave you a hint i told you subtalar neutral is an ideal one so what is a normal one that should be something normal ideal is not something that we can maintain that is because when we estimate the subtalar neutral we find out that that is a controversial concept and that is a controversial concept because uh, normally in walking we have about three degrees of uh, inversion at the heel strike okay inversion at heel strike this is at the heel strike in walking okay and when it uh, moves from heel strike it is actually becoming around 2.2 degrees of inversion at uh, stance phase end of the stance was nearly 55 percent of the gait second again this becomes an inversion in the swing phase so when we look at this figure uh, when we look at this graph we can see that uh, at heel strike the initial 5 or 10 degrees of the gait cycle or the initial degrees of the gait cycle not even up to the foot flat the foot remains in inversion but during the majority of the gait cycle that is in the foot um, in the foot flat mid stance top off up to the heel off actually what is happening the foot is an inverted position so we can tell simply that our foot is more in an inverted position than the inverted position and this is what is happening in weight bearing or in the walking so if our foot is actually in this position 
can we take this position which is actually the straight line position zero degrees of motion as the normal one we cannot because normally in our body we have a slight degree of inversion or subtalar joint is always in an inverted position so if it is always in an inverted position this concept of subtalar neutral becomes meaningless so subtalar neutral is something like ideal sitting posture or ideal standing posture it is ideal it is there but it is not something that we can adopt so we can call this to be the normal position of the foot so we can call or we can give a term known as normal resting position normal resting position of subtalar joint is inverted so the subtalar joint is normally slightly inverted normally slightly inverted from this fact we can figure out this answer so note that uh, subtalar joint is a neutral no it is not that we have a straight line always but in majority of our daily life activities or in normal activities we have subtalar joint in slightly inverted why is it significant this is significant because we a patient comes to our clinic and we estimate the subtalar joint inversion and we do not remember about this thing that is foot is slightly inverted we do we forget that if you forget that what happens we treat that uh, the patient is having greater degree of inversion and the inversion is linked to pronation so we tell that uh, the patient is having increased pronation but it may not be increased pronation because normally itself the foot is inverted if inversion happens, this is the normal position, this is inversion, and this is the position of pronation. So, inversion accompanies with the pronation, and inversion accompanies with supination. You know that actually. So, we cannot tell that uh, subtalar joint of a patient whom we are evaluating is actually in subtalar normal position or or is actually in uh, increased pronated position by only estimating the subtalar neutral but we have to remember this in the our measure our mind that uh, subtalar joint has slight degrees of uh, normal resting inversion and it is a normal physiological uh, physiological situation or a uh, stand position we must remember that okay that means our estimation of the subtalar joint neutral is an ideal concept and there are lot of controversies and lot and lot of studies going on so this is one way of estimating subtalar joint neutral position there is another way that is known as the talo navicular technique many orthotists pro, pro, prosthetic prosthetic designers actually develop or depends upon this talo navicular technique what is that do you know this is actually for example if this is a foot this is the talus this is the talus head okay talus is actually having its head like this so this is the medial end and lateral end so when we look for pronation what is happening we studied earlier talar adduction abduction and we saw that there is a slight prominence the foot becomes slightly prominent in the lateral end the fruit becomes slightly prominent to this end we studied that earlier so what happens here if the foot is in this position that is your talar heads at medial and lateral aspects are normally normal or there is no slight degree of return to or turning to the lateral side there is no projection in the lateral side that means lateral malleoli side there is no projection in the medial malleoli side then we tell it as a subtalar neutral why i'm not doing that because uh, it's not a um, uh, functionally important or it's not a highly reliable technique because the technique is uh, recently proved to be not that effective so we depend upon the subtalar neutral by this measurement but still this is uh, having some limitation that is because the normal resting position as we told you is not the neutral one always remember that but there are some variations some individuals might have the normal resting position as in subtalar neutral itself okay but majority case slightly inverted or pronated so your tectalar joint is slightly inverted and subtalar joint is slightly pronated and inversion is the movement that is predominantly happening in the subtalar joint right what about the other movements like uh, a plantar flexion dorsiflexion one plantar flexion dorsiflexion etc do you know the real values of that can anyone tell 
we have some estimation of that values and that values are values are something like a, a 6.8 degree or 7.8 degree etc in from the perspective plane for a plant of friction dots inflection and uh, which one attraction attraction so this we can say that uh, it's not much so relevant because inversion is 5 to 10 degree inversion is 5 to 10 another one is 25 to 20 to 30 degree totally giving 25 to 40 degree of range of motion so this becomes functionally insignificant and this has a high variable between the individuals so we are not able to measure that so let us summarize this topic by understanding this concept of subtalar no neutral and uh, by adding on to another concept that uh, subtalar joints primary function is actually dissipating the forces the dissipating the forces in the transverse plane the rotatory forces in the transverse plane when we are weight bearing this transverse plane rotatory motions are actually dissipated by our subtalar joint so that the structures in the joint in the angle do not get injured so when there is a supination position the subtalar joint is a relatively closed back position because all the jaw ligaments comes to be approximated Whereas in pronated position, subtalar joint, because of the talar adduction, is slightly in a loose back position. So supination is the closed back position, and pronation is the loose back position of the subtalar joint. Just remember that in your mind. You need not go into the biomechanics and why it is a supination, why it is pronation, etc. You just need to remember the points. And stability of the subtalar joint is provided by the ligaments, but the exact role of ligaments in providing the stability is also controversial. So with this, we discuss uh, and end the concept of subtalar neutral and subtalar joint range of motion. And in next video, we are going straight away into transverse tarsal joint. And there is no video tomorrow. Day after tomorrow, we will have a video on the mid tarsal joint. Until then, stay tuned and if you like the video, don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to my channel.